Hello again and welcome to FCV's latest addition to your collection, the 1994 Tour de France. I'm Phil Liggett, joined on occasion by my partner Paul Sherwin, a seven times rider in the Tour who interviews the riders. And I hope you enjoy what I think is a really remarkable race in many ways. The Tour de France claims rightly to be the greatest annual sporting event and throughout July the race personifies all of the emotion of sport. The elation which is born from success. and the determination to succeed in the face of pain and the sadness when retirement is the only way home. And this year too, the Tour de France can be seen on British roads for only the second time since it all began in 1903. The race this year begins in Lille, going across to Britain before running down the western coast towards the Pyrenees, an unusual route, then across the Languedoc towards the Alps, through a very difficult section of the Alps before finally finishing in Paris. For the riders too, they'll visit the shores of Great Britain for the first time since 1974. After Brighton, it will go to Britain's first naval city, Portsmouth. Then they return and head across to the Alps for the final showdown. And after they leave the snow-clad mountains, for those that survive, they will see the Eiffel Tower. The race coming home for its traditional finish on the Champs-Élysées after 23 days, almost 4,000 kilometres, 18 mountains, four countries, and that for the survivors of 189. Let's look at the pre-race favourites. Alex Zula, two years ago, brought Switzerland's real hope of becoming a future winner when, on his birthday and first tour, he briefly led the race. Then last year, a crash meant a disappointing 41st place finish. Then in April, Alex came fourth in the Tour of Spain. If he doesn't fall off, he can expect something better than that here. Gianni Bugno is loved or hated in Italy because of his erratic performances. This is his seventh tour and his best performance came in 1991 when he finished second. Life is either up or down for the ubiquitous Italian who wore the rainbow jersey of world champion for two years. He promises a challenge again after winning the Tour de Flanders Classic in April. Colombia's Alvaro Mejia is making his fifth journey around France. Last year he confirmed the faith his country has in him by finishing fourth. He also showed he could climb well alongside Miguel Indurain. And he's improved his time trialling as well. We should see much of him this time. Back to is our old friend Claudio Kipucci. But will he ever win a big stage race? This happy fighter has finished twice second and once third. And he probably won't succeed either this time. But it won't be for the want of trying. As his historic win at Sestria in Italy showed two years ago. A podium place in Paris is always the aim of this positive Italian. Most believe only one man can take on Miguel Indurain, and that's Tony Rominger, who last year finished second and won the King of the Mountains. In the last time trial too, he also beat the great Spaniard. This year, he won the Tour of Spain for a record third year. Well, last year, Rominger hurt the handsome Indurain, who only finished third in last month's Tour of Italy, but few believe he'll lose this year. He's still the king of the time trial, but once more must prove it again. And in the mountains, some believe he's fallible. However, he still remains the centre of attention. Well, favourites there may be, but now is the time to prove their tag. The prologue time trial here in Lille, 7.2 kilometres. And Chris Borman ranking among the favourites over the short distance. A winner of two prologues already this year, his first full season as a pro. He's riding on the same GAN team as the team captain, Greg LeMond, probably riding his final Tour de France, the former world champion three-time winner, who has helped encourage Chris Boardman. Well, Boardman starting 10th from the end of the list of riders this morning, and now having to set a time that will match that at least of Armand de las Cuevas, who's finished with 8 minutes 13.38 seconds. And this is turning out to be an incredible performance because Boardman must have top speeds of 60 kilometres an hour on this course. There aren't too many corners, but the rider just ahead of him here in the finishing straight is none less than Luc Leblanc from the Festina team. And Leblanc is going to be caught for a minute right on the line, and that will be a big shock for the Frenchman. Chris Borman boring down on him now. Leblanc sees him moves away. Borman switches tracks. This is going to be a tremendous ride by Borman. Indurain and Roming are still to come. That's the time he's aiming at Adel Asquerius. He is absolutely annihilating it. So Borman, who said only the night before he wasn't sure he felt too well, now has a tremendous time on the board of 7 minutes 49.973 seconds. And surely that is going to take some beating.
Certainly the Boulevard de la Liberté here in Lille has never seen anything like that. 55.1 kilometres an hour. Let's go down to Paul Sherwin with Chris Boardman. Chris, you came in. You've come in with the first time at the moment. That must be an incredible way to start your first Tour de France. Well, yeah, I mean, it, as I said, I've been in pressure situations before. Uh, so I've had a bit of a crash course with the Olympic Games. But this is a different league, really. It's like, it's like the Olympics coming to town for the day. So uh, I'm really glad it came together because I haven't felt so good for the last week. And I've been a bit down because I realised the opportunity that's there for me coming to Britain. Uh, it's probably going to be the only time in my pro career. And so the opportunity is just fantastic. So I've been a bit frustrated, but today everything went really good, so I can't complain. And what's the pressure been like? Because there's so many people here. I know you've been to the Olympic Games, but this is the biggest bike race in the world. Yeah, well, it's nice, really, because like when you're in this position, like right now, this is because you've done well. So this bit's easy to deal with. It's the bit two seconds before the start that isn't. What's it going to be like for the next few minutes? Because you have to wait for Miguel Indurain and Tony Rominger to come by. Again, I've been there before, and... Uh, it's going to be tough, but we'll just have to put you see. Thanks. And that's all you can do, Chris. And this now is the approach of Tony Rominger, the rider who beat Miguel Indurain last year and has come here with great hopes and joint favour to win the Tour. But look at his time. He's already way outside the time of Chris Boardman. Boardman has done the fastest time trial in the history of the Tour de France, and Rominger is not going to approach it. He's second on the board with just Miguel Indurain to finish. And time is running out for Indurain. Look at the clock, and time has gone by him. This has been a tremendous achievement by Chris Boardman. He's waited all year. He said he would come here and win this prologue. He's now done just that. So Miguel Indurain beaten for the first time in a prologue for three Tours de France. He won't be in yellow tomorrow. And for Chris Boardman, the first British leader of the Tour for more than 30 years. Do you realise now what you've got on your shoulders? No, I'm, I'm rather annoyed actually, because it's the same as the Olympic Games and it, it's just over like that and it, it just doesn't sink in. And you're just in the middle and if you like from the inside, I'm the same person, it's from the outside it looks different and it's taken a while to sink in. I'll enjoy it tonight. So the overall situation, Boardman wins 7 minutes 49, 15 seconds on Indurain, 19 on Romiga, 22 on Zula. So on this morning stage of 234 kilometres, taking the race away from Lille to Armentier. And not surprisingly, a reasonable day for Borman because the whole field has come out together to fight out the sprint finish. And this is going to be a tight win on the left. The champion of Belgium, Wilfred Nelson, starts to go for the line now. Nelson's got the inside. The whole field stringing out. Nelson leading through. The champion looking for an early win here. Oh, my goodness me, they've hit the policemen. They've all come down. That is a terrible crash. Gonchenkov has gone down. Fontanelli's gone down. That is an amazing pile-up. Lawrence Jalabert has gone down. Now watch this again here and watch the rider in black. You can see the policeman looking straight at the race and then into them goes Jalabert. Hits those cans really very, very hard indeed. I've never seen anything like it. This is Wilfred Nelson on the floor and with him is Lawrence Jalabert. Well, how on earth did that happen? The problem was the, the policeman was there and he had a camera to his face. It was obvious. People say he didn't have a camera in his face, but he definitely had a camera up to his face because he, he didn't even move. I always expect a big crash in, in the Tour de France in the final kilometer, but not, not a crash caused by policemen, a crash caused more by the riders uh, colliding together. And in the melee there, let me just remind you that Jamaluddin Abdu Japarov was the winner of the stage. And that's the way it could be again here because Jamaluddin Abdu Japarov not enjoying the ride to Boulogne sur Mer and being beaten by the sprinter Jean Paul Van Poppel and Chris Bourbon keeping his yellow jersey. So England is getting closer and Chris is happy about that. Overall, the prologue gaps still remain between Boardman, Indurain, Rominger and the rest. But the team time trial, stage three of 66 kilometres, it finds the Gann team in all sorts of trouble and Boardman himself has his problems. Loose handlebars soon after the start and now problems with Greg LeMond as well on the climbs. LeMond cannot keep pace with his team as England comes on to the horizon on the channel. Well, it looks as though it's all gone wrong for Borman in the very last kilometres of the day, and that is Eddie Seigneur overshooting the right-hand bend as they approach the finish, and they're getting nowhere near the time of GB, so Borman will be out of the leader's yellow jersey. I'm very disappointed myself, but, you know, when you say you can say you've given it 100% and really turned yourself inside out, then you can't ask for more. 
Well, the GB team showed their perfection at this uh, type of racing again, and in fact, Motorola finished second, and overall, Johan Museo now leads Indurain Sorensen and Lance Armstrong up to fourth. A new channel tunnel which now links France with Great Britain carrying passengers for the first time for the start this morning from Dover Castle for a ride of 204 kilometres. And Britain laid out the red carpet. And the arrival of the Union flag, and we can't see it, but also Johan Museo's yellow jersey is there as well. This is the route, 206 kilometres from Dover via Canterbury, then through the Ashdown Forest, home of Sean Yates, and into Brighton. And the crowd here in the castle restricted to only 2,000 by the police for safety reasons, but the race itself now moving off before a, more, a much bigger audience than that. Sean Yates has been given his head, he's in the Ashdown Forest, and I think he's got permission of the peloton, and that's why he's here to meet his family as the race closes in behind him. But there is a breakaway on, by the way, and Cabello of the Kelme team is clear with Magnon of France and Van Zella. But it looks as though the main field don't mind, and in Brighton, it's a victory for Francesco Cabello. And that's the Spaniards' first victory of a stage in the Tour de France. The yellow jersey going across to the third-place finisher and teammate of Museu, Flavio Vanzella, by four seconds. The second day in Britain, 182 kilometres, based on Portsmouth, going out via Winchester, Basingstoke, through Petersfield, and home to Portsmouth for the finish. The police estimating 1.2 million spectators yesterday, and they say there's more out today as the race goes past HMS Victory. And these are the famous Red Arrow Squadron of Great Britain, with the Hawk aircraft putting on a display over the finishing line. And now the race is coming in, and although it looked like being a breakaway, right now it's going to be a bunch sprint, and Sean Yates is trying to finish off two days in Britain with a win, but surely he's hit the front too soon. He's still a long way from the finish, although we're around the circuit here in Portsmouth, and the whole field have marked him. Well, Yates has shown his colours, but he has really left it too early, and he's gone now because of an attack gone. An attack gone through on the inside, and this is going to be a good move. This is one of the ZG teams starting the attack, but the telecom boys are closing in because Olaf Ludwig is thirsty for a victory and he hasn't got it yet, he's come close. But now the telecom team are trying to bring Olaf Ludwig through, he's in second place at the moment. A couple of left-handers coming up to the finish now, this is a good run at the line by Christian Hen, I think it is, of the telecom team who's bringing up Ludwig in second place now. Museo's getting up there as well, Abdu Japarov in sixth or seventh place, it's the last corner before the finish now. This is a great finish for a sprinter here. And in fact, it looked to me as though the Mercatoni Uno boys are trying to get uh, Martinello up there as well. They split on opposite sides of the road now and still they're trying to bring Ludwig on the right of the picture. Martinello's over on the left. Abdu Jabarov through the middle. This is going to be a great tussle for the line now. Jan Zverada is trying to get through on the far right as well. Look at the little dashing Abdu Jabarov. He's missed all of the wheels this time. Ludwig's coming clear with Minelli. Ludwig and Minelli and right on the line. Well, that's the first win for Nico Minelli that we've ever seen in the Tour de France stage he gets it by inches ahead of Olaf Ludwig after the telecom team did all of the work Martinello thirds Zorado fourth what a finish for the sprinters Abdu Japarov and Van Poppel overall Vanzello keeps his four second lead over Museo Indurain is third and Armstrong fourth no change in the second day here in Great Britain but these are the people who made this race the crowd saying goodbye after the first time for 20 years the tour has visited these roads I'd like to thank everybody. I mean, I know it may sound corny, but I've never seen anything like it, and I remember it as long as I live. It's absolutely fantastic. And Chris Borman speaking for just about everybody, including Jean-Francois Bernard here on the airplane as they now fly back over to Cherbourg. And the distance, 265 kilometres now down to the capital of Brittany in Rennes. No real challenge as the race heading now towards the Pyrenees, but there's still a few days away. Just the small time bonus sprints and, of course, a very delicate lead indeed for the overall leader, Flavio Vanzella. And the sprint's brewing extremely precious now because this small breakaway got away near the end today and this is an attack by Gianluca luca Bortolami. Sean Yates is looking over his shoulder for some help. Frankie Andreu is supplying it. As, in fact, Abdu Japarov in this breakaway, they thought that he was the man to take the stage. They've marked him. But Bortolami, who's never won the stage of the Tour de France, at two kilometres to go, has gone clear. And I think the breakaway is making Abdu Japarov do all of the chasing. 
Andreo looks over his shoulder at Jens Heppner, the champion of Germany. And just up behind Heppner here now, we have Beat Zeberg. But the big Guido Bontempi also trying to master the move, followed by Sean Yates. That's the composition of the breakaway. And you know, Gianluca Bortolami may well have taken his chance well here. It would have been nice if Sean Yates had done it. But in fact, Yates is trying to take the leader's yellow jersey. He's the best placed overall. But he mustn't allow Bortolami too much lead. Otherwise, Bortolami will have enough time back to take the overall lead. And look at these crowds here. They must have been taking a note out of the British handbook, having seen what's happened these past two days. And Bortolami going for gold now, best known for the reputation he's built in England a few years ago. He's won two stages of the Kellogg's Tour of Britain. He won his first one in 1990 when he just turned pro. Then in 1991, he finished the Tour de France last year, but he really was an anonymous rider. Now he's not going to be because I think he's going to hang on. Bortolami swinging into the home straight now. He's seen the banner. He's slipped it up one more gear. They're all lining up behind him. They've mastered Abdu Japarov, but I wonder if Abdu Japarov has still got the legs. He'd be fuming at missing this. This is how Sean Kelly lost so many stages in the Tour de France. There was always somebody nipped away. There's Abdu. He's going to get second place. Bortolami is face a picture. They are not going to catch him. Gianluca Bortolami of Italy is going to take the stage win. The clock will decide whether he's got the yellow jersey. It must be desperately close between him and Sean Yates. But so far, this opening week of the tour has been a story about the British Boardman, the great days in Britain, and now I think Yates has got the yellow jersey. This is the group coming in, and they're sprinting only for ninth place now. And in fact, Jan Zerada is the rider in third place. Olaf Ludwig over to left. The sprinter still willing to have a go. But look at the clock. That's what they're all counting down for Yates for being in yellow. The sprint is beginning now. Jan Kersipu is the rider on the left, who I think is going to take it on the line. Zerada's coming at him. But Kersipu is holding off Zerada. And in fact, Kersipu gets it. The clock's important. I make Yates in yellow. I make it desperately close. Bortolami is the man who could spoil the party here. He was the rider, and look at this, Yates doesn't know, he just does not know. Sean, you've done it. You've got the yellow jersey. How do you feel, man? The bush bar, the bush bar. Unbelievable. Sean, after such a long career. Yeah, it just shows you. No, no, it's the fat lady sings. <laughs> well, she's singing now, Sean, the leader by a single second, but for Greg Lamond, it's the end of the line. I mean, uh... I don't know, this is not what I imagined finishing my career like this. This is, uh, nope. <coughs> I had a dream of racing well this year. Nope. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Nope. Who knows? Some dreams don't come true. Yeah, life goes on though. I mean, I've had my dream in the past, so you know, at least I've got, at least I've had what I've had. And, uh, Sounds a little bit sour. What do you mean? No, I'm just saying. I, I'm, I'm, I'm at least I'm, I'm glad I had a career that I've had already. I mean, I, it's uh, it's unfortunate I can't finish better. I always dream of finishing better, but uh, and I can't say I'm totally over. But uh, at least for this tour, I'm over. You know. Yes, are, are you sure that I'm doing? Well, I don't think I'll race well here. Uh, no. You start a tour like this, and you start having a couple bad days already in the first week. Oh, yes. You might have, you might feel better one day to have a stage or something like that, but. To really feel good now. Tour de France secret is being good from the start to the finish. You're, too You're far not away. allowed to have any bad days. Too far away now. Yeah, for sure. Sadly, it is for Greg Lamond who leaves the race in the sag wagon, having won the tour three times previously. But for another tour veteran, Sean Yates, wearing the yellow jersey for the first time, oh, life continues. Yeah, I mean, I know I've done a lot of work for other guys and. Gilbert Duclos just came in the room and he was really happy for me, so it was great. And I know people think that I deserve some, you know, victories and I've had a few along the way, but for what motivates me, motivates me is to ride for other people and, and that's fine by me. But and I think that's why the British public like me so much because I, you know, I'm not a superstar, but I always stick it out and I've done over the last 13 years and I think that's what makes me popular. For England and huh? after England, but not in England. Nice <laughs> ride, right, mate. Well, incredibly, there are only two British riders in the race, and now they've both worn the leader's yellow jersey. That's not been done since 1962. It's not been so bad, has it? It's, uh, unfortunately, we had the jersey before England and immediately after and not during, which is a bit frustrating for both of us, but I was made up for Sean. This is, uh, he says his last tour. I don't believe it. I wouldn't believe it if I was you. 
Uh, and so if that is the case, superb. Taking the yellow jersey in your last tour, it's, it's absolutely, it must be a dream for him, I made it. But the next day for Sean Yates, the hand of Rolf Sorensen held him back while Johan Museo won a six second sprint bonus and Museo took over the race lead as he did on the approach into Britain three days previously. He now leads by that six seconds ahead of Sean Yates, Bortolami third and Vanzella fourth. And the very next day at Tulisac, it was a win by Bo Hamburger of Denmark and the race lead stayed with Johan Museo by five seconds ahead of Yates who was down to ten. But now we're on the eve of the time trial. Last year, Museo also led the night before such an event. He's in no doubt as to who will win. I have one, one favorite, it's, it's, it's Miguel Enderain. He, uh, he is very strong. He always in the ten, uh, of, of ten first place of the group. Maybe on second place, Rominger and then uh, Les Cuivas. And Johan Museo? Oh, far behind. Well, at least he's honest anyway, but one man who hopes not to be too far behind this morning on the time trial between Perigueux and Bergerac, 64 kilometres, is Chris Boardman. Boardman, however, has had a terrible ride. It has never gone right for him in the heat of the day. He knows it too, and Chris Boardman won't see yellow again in this tour, and I think now he'll think only of retirement, but this is Tony Rominger. He's had a back wheel puncture, he's had a change, but he's lost time. His time jacks are saying he's running close to Indurain, but look at this. Miguel Indurain has gone ploughing past the world champion Lance Armstrong, and this after something like 16 kilometres of racing, and Armstrong is in big trouble. Well, Indurain has just gone straight by him. All of the checks are confirming that Indurain has refound those time trial legs. He's gone through 6.5 kilometers in the best time. This is Tony Rominger, who is staying closest to him just about. He's less than a minute down on him at the moment, but I did say a minute. The weather here is so hot and humid, it is cruel racing in these conditions. And the first few kilometers of the time trial today, extremely hilly. 10 kilometers to go now for Miguel Indurain, another rider in his sight, and that'll be Armand de las Cuevas, and can you believe that? Because he's picked off his Minutemen so easily today. And Miguel Indurain looking so, so good once more. The battle between him and Tony Rominger, it's a question now whether it will be realized because Rominger is losing time. He's now almost two minutes behind on the road. And that looks like Franco Vona, who's now being picked up by Tony Rominger. So Romangu is riding a good solid time trial here, but I've got to say it, it's not in the same class as it was a year ago when he beat Miguel Indurain. He's not going to beat him today. He should be the best time when he gets there. Thierry Marie is holding the best time at the finishing line. Romangu inside a kilometre. And Franco Vona not worrying there. Let's go back down the course now and just take a look at Miguel Indurain. He's absolutely flying today. Well, we felt the last week of the Tour of Italy three weeks ago, his old form was coming back, and now he's showing us it really is. This is the arrival of Rominger, the first indication we'll get now of the sort of quality of the ride. Thierry Marie is on the ball with one hour, 20 minutes. Rominger is going to be well inside that. This will be the new marker for Tony Rominger at the start, the joint favourite to win the Tour. But he's leaving himself now an awful lot of work to do. Rumours abound that he's not feeling well. He's got a slight leg injury. But he's always denied it directly to the press. And I wonder now if Tony Rominger is a little bit off the peak of his form. It's not the time to be in such a situation. Rominger, however, turning in what will be the fastest time, at least till the arrival of Miguel Indurain. So he's going to maintain his challenge up there, at least in second place overall in the classification. But the pretenders have now had their day for sure. Museo will be out of yellow. He's way behind at the time checks. And two minutes, 45 seconds. That's the new leader, Tony Rominger. But it shall all be altered now if the midway time checks are to be believed. Indurain has returned to his old time trialing form. And he's still an awful lot of fight in him as the line approaches. Well, they've all come and they've all died in the heat today, except Miguel Indurain. Just look at the clock now. It is a tremendous ride, and now he's going to take the leader's yellow jersey, and the question is, can he keep it through the Alps and the Pyrenees? The Pyrenees coming up first. This has been a tremendous performance by the king of the time trial. Indurain is the first time on the board now. It's going to be about two minutes, and he hits the line. It is two minutes exactly. Well, here's one man who knows what it's like to feel the pain of Miguel Indurain. Lance. That was a tough time trial, eh? <coughs> I was... 
I mean, certainly that was the most extreme I've ever had to go. It was in the last 15 Ks. I couldn't even, I didn't even feel like I was pedaling. It was just kind of going around and oh, I'm completely exhausted right now. I'm in zilch left. What was it like when Indurain caught you? Was that a big surprise that he caught you so quickly? He's flying along. <laughs> he was flying. That was, I was, you know, that was my big goal before the race is to uh, stay away from him, but he's super right now. Romager's not even, it's, it's over, it's finished now. But the way that guy came by, and that was probably part of the reason that I'm was so wasted in the end because I tried to match his speed and he goes along the flats 55, 56, 57 k's an hour. I was 53.11, getting dropped. Well, can you believe that? Miguel Indurain winning the time trial by two minutes and Rominger four minutes 22 from De Las Cuevas. Bourbon five minutes 27 seconds back in fifth. Overall, Indurain now leading the tour by two minutes 28 seconds ahead of Rominger. De Las Cuevas is third. So the big man is back and heading for his fourth straight tour win, but he still has the mountains of a very difficult route to conquer. But not today. Bergerac to Caor, 160 and a half kilometers, the 10th stage. And the weather now is so humid you won't believe it. But the riders in the control here of Bonesto now, a familiar scene as Indurain tries to keep a leash on most of the men, but a small breakaway has got away towards the finish. And that is an attack by the champion of France, Jackie Durand, who retained his French title just before the tour began. And it looks as though he's trying to slip away from the breakaway group here. The rider nearest the camera is the Australian Stephen Hodge. And I think you know that ja Jackie Durand has made the move here. He tries as often as he can. He was featured in a long breakaway when we went up to northern France with Stephen Swart of New Zealand on the Motorola team. And uh, he got caught on that occasion, but now he's gone. Mario Chiesa sitting at the back here for Carrera and giving a little reminder to Gianluca Bortoloma. He's actually the best rider placed overall in this breakaway. He's still lying fourth, but he's now nearly six minutes behind. The main field are just two minutes off the back of this breakaway, and Girard is trying to now stay clear of them all the way to the finish. Well, Bonesto have monitored the length uh, of escape here, and they're chasing behind now, but Jackie Girard is waiting for no one. He searched for the big win, and it would be fitting if the champion of France gave France the first stage win of this year's Tour de France. He's not the most popular of riders among his teammates. I'm not quite sure why that is, but anyway, he's certainly thrown the gauntlet down to the rest of them today. A few deep breaths. Just two kilometers left to go to the finish. The regroup behind here now, Serpolini, the youngest man in the race, is also here for the Lamprey team. But look at this crowd now. They're welcoming the arrival of the champion of France, and I don't think they're going to get on terms. I'm pretty sure that Stephen Hodge will be really annoyed this break has gone. He must have fancied his chances. Girard is going to take no chance at all now. He's just checking over his shoulder, and then he's going to enjoy the next few metres. As he approaches the line, a big, big crowd here for the first time visit of the Tour de France to Cahors. And a big crowd too. Well, all that remains now is the traditional salute here from the champion. He makes sure there's nobody there. He salutes his team car. He's got the victory for France. As always, the French press have been waiting for somebody from France to come out and win the stage. Well, this is the moment they've been waiting for and the one that Jackie Durand has also been waiting for. They got into that breakaway group and Durand made his move about five kilometers from the finish. And the rest of the breakaway are not even in sight. Well, it's not going to do anything at all to the overall situation because Durand is too far behind for that, but this is the moment here, remember. 44 kilometers an hour, a good average speed today. It was only 160 kilometers, and Serpolini's nipped away. Stephen Hodge looks over his shoulder. Serpolini, youngest man in the race, gets second. And a little bit disgusted with that, he clearly felt he wanted the win. Hodge gets third, and it will be Bortolami in fourth place. Tell us about the heat out there, because this is probably one of the hottest Tour de France's I've known for many years. It's incredible. I don't know how I managed today. My heart rate in the last half or so was um, was, was equal or over my threshold. I was really worried because 
I was thinking, shit, I'm getting a sunstroke here because my heart rate was really, even on the flats, was up around my threshold. And um, it was, I was actually quite worried about it because I was up 170, 172 on the flats. Coming around the river here, before we even started to climb, I was at 170 and before, <laughs> that's my threshold. And I was really worried that, you know, my heart was just going through the, going through the roof. Well, it wasn't, Stephen. All is well. And Jackie Durand winning the stage from Serpolini. Stephen Hodge there. He finished third. Bortolami fourth. And Christian Hen in fifth place. This is the 11th stage and the entry into the Pyrenees. A new finish at the top of Otakam, which is a climb outside of the Mecca city of Lourdes. And this really is a pretty part of France. We roll now down towards the Pyrenees. Well, at least they talk when they're not in combat. Miguel Indurain alongside second overall Tony Rominger. And this is the weather today, sunny, but mist at the finishing line, which we understand is completely covered at the moment in low cloud, and the temperature a little bit cooler as we now go into the Pyrenees, and we're on the eve of the rest day here. So it's goodbye now. All of the time bonus sprints are behind us. No more bonuses for the riders at all. As they now, as uh, that was uh, Peter de Klerk, the king of the mountains, they're winning the small climb, and I wonder if he'll still be in contention when we get to the big one. De Klerk holding on to the polka dot jersey thus far on the small climbs of this year's tour. It's all going to change now. As we approach now, we've left Lourdes, and we're heading up now towards the start of the climb, which is up to Otakam. And this is the Motorola rider at the back, is Stephen Swart. This is the breakaway, but you know the feel, they're not very far behind. This breakaway is formed. They're trying to make a run for the mountain here. But whether, in fact, they're going to hold it off towards the finish, that is highly debatable now. Massimo Girotto is in this breakaway too. The Magnon of France is the rider on the far right for the Castorama team. But the field are only inches behind this breakaway now, and this is the reason the Onse team, hoping to get Alex Zula in play, has closed the race down. Moving further up the climb, and this is Miguel Indurain, followed by Peter Ugramov from the Gavis team. And out of sight of our cameras, there has been an attack, a lone attack at that, by Marco Pantani, a little Italian climber who came to the fore this year with a great second place in the Tour of Italy. And now Indurain is going to have to work out quite what to do about that. Ugramov in second place. And the Gavis team pushing all the men to the fore here. That was Zaina. And this is Luc Lebon of Festina. Nearest the camera is Armand de las Cuevas. A Richard Veronque on the far side. Little Nelson Rodriguez. Alex Zula in the pink. This is Lordolino Cubino, 171. He won a stage of the Tour of Italy this year. And it looks as though Leblanc is trying to open the gap. And I don't see Indurain there, so I think he's already gone. Delano of Spain, the Spanish champion. This is Rominger in all sorts of trouble now. Rominger has been unable to answer the attack that has come from Indurain. Pantani is still ahead on the road. Udo Boltz are riding alongside Tony Rominger, and Rominger really does look in trouble here. Rominger is losing ground, so it could be true what they're saying. He isn't on top of his form. And maybe the heat of the valleys, now combining with the chiller of the climb of Otakam, has got to him. Well, also being dropped there now is Zaina at five kilometres to go. Pantani is 22 seconds ahead of this group. And De Las Cuevas trying to hang on to Indurain, but he's in trouble too, De Las Cuevas. He's not a great climber, he's a good time trial rider, but it looks to me as though he's cracking like he did in the Giro d'Italia. Luc Leblanc hanging on to the back wheel of Miguel Indurain. Well, just what is Indurain thinking of now? He's got one rider ahead of him, Marco Pantani. And Indurain, with all the time in hand he requires, is now trying to go for gold, I think, here on this first day in the Pyrenees. De Las Cuevas struggling just to keep them in sight right now. The other rider up there, by the way, is Richard Verenck. Also the Festina team, the Festina team have ridden so well. There's our friend the Devil who joins us every day in the last few kilometres, but this is the rider heading the race now. Pantani, who attacked at the bottom of the climb, is still hanging on, but they're coming back slowly but surely towards him. And there's only Luc Leblanc now with Indurain. This has been a tremendous climb by Miguel. 
You very, very rarely see this man come out on the offensive in the mountains. He's always been content to follow, doing the damage in the time trials, but now he must be worried about Pantani. For the moment, Pantani is not a threat to the overall, but he will be by the end of the day if he keeps this rhythm up. Indurain continues to set the rhythm. Luc Leblanc, former champion of France, who finished fifth in the 1991 Tour de France. Along for the ride, but Pantani, he looks like a pure climber as well, doesn't he? He certainly looks a lot older than his 24 years, too. But now Luc Leblanc has recovered, prepared to work with Indurain. Indurain is actually hurting himself. Take a look at his face. Well, this is a great show of defiance by Miguel. He's trying to destroy this field. He started in the time trial two days ago. There's a rest day tomorrow in Lourdes. And if he keeps this up, he's going to go down onto the rest day with a very big lead overall. Leblanc trying to keep with him at the moment with uh, having no difficulty at all. And up there in the mist, and I think I can just see the white jersey of Pantani through the mist. There it is. So they brought him back. It was a brave attack by Pantani. At one stage, I thought he got it. He went up to about 25 seconds. At five kilometers, it was down to 22. And now we're not far off being a couple of kilometers from the finish, and I would say it's no more than 10 or 12. Leblanc is riding extremely well here. Mind you, you could say the same for Big Mig. Well, here is Pantani. I'm trying to look round over the shoulder to see if those cars are following the yellow jersey. And yes, they are. It's all over for Pantani. If he's going to win the stage, he's going to have to win it in the sprint because Miguel Indurain and Luc Leblanc are closing in. And he, he has a tremendous rhythm going on this climb. It is a very difficult climb, this one, Otakam. It's the first time I've seen it, and I think the majority of the race, too. It is a fine indeed. But about 30 kilometers outside of Lourdes, when the riders finish, they'll get in the cars and race back home to Lourdes for a good wash and a change because it's chilly up here today. But uh, just look at Indurain. He's doing the majority of the race driving here, and Pantani has now taken a good, solid look over his shoulder to see who is coming up. He's seen the yellow of Indurain. He may not know yet uh, the name of the rider in Indurain slipstream. But we now have three riders at the summit. And I make it around about two kilometers from the top, and in fact, LeBlanc deciding that's enough, he's going to have a go. Luc LeBlanc has chosen the moment to attack to leave Pantani with Indurain. And this is a great show by Luc LeBlanc. The French had a stage win yesterday with Jackie Durand. And now it could well be, as we go to the rest day, they're going to get win number two. And this will have a nice taste about it in the mountains. So Luc LeBlanc has opened the gap. Indurain has tried to step up the rhythm just a little bit as the Basque flags fly in the face of Miguel. And I do believe that Indurain has recovered and he's coming back. Well, Indurain is coming back inch by inch and Pantani somehow has found the strength to hang on to that back wheel of Miguel Indurain. Well, one thing's for sure now, any thoughts that Indurain wasn't coming here to win this tour for the fourth straight year, that's gone out the window. Indurain has come here to destroy the field. And he's now clawed his way back up to Luc Leblanc. The final sprint to close the gap. Leblanc will ease up now, I think. And Pantani is off. He's been detached from the back. And so the little climber from Italy has gone. And Leblanc has been tamed by Miguel. Well, we haven't seen a banner for a little while, but I think we're inside the last two kilometers. It could well be inside the last kilometer. That banner perhaps coming up shortly. And Leblanc will not ease up at all. I guess he's figuring that the chase down by Indurain might have proven just a little bit too much and to keep the pressure on. Pantani also is clawing his way back. So if those two ease, he'll be back on. And Tony Rominger, by the way, news reaching us, is over two minutes behind on the climb, and I would think the end of his Tour de France because by the end of the day, he'd be best part of five minutes down. And Indurain knows it, and that's why he's come here to attack at the bottom of this climb, to do as much damage as possible and give the riders all of tomorrow to think about it too. Because just look at this, I've never seen Indurain ride like this. 
He is full of aggression. He's always ridden such a calculated tour, but not today. He's come here to prove to everybody just who he is. We've just passed the one kilometre to go now. Injure now steering the train here. And I think he's got Luc Leblanc on the defensive. The gap is there. Leblanc won't give up easy. Very courageous little rider, Luc Leblanc. He started out alongside Cyril Guimard, the man who's trained more Tour de France winners than any other team manager when he turned pro back in 1987. Comes from the Limousin. It's a beautiful area of France. And Leblanc now trying to hang on to the one man who has set the world of cycling alight these past three or four years, Miguel Indurain. But it's not often you see him with a face like that. He is riding away. He sees this as the last stage of the Tour de France. I think he wants a big lead. And I'm wondering if it's because he is afraid of the mountains to come. He is afraid of what the Alps hold in that last week. And in fact, Leblanc is still finding the strength to work with him. That's a tremendous piece of riding by Luc Leblanc. He rode a good season as champion of France. He won the title back in 1992. He had three wins then the following year as the champion. And this year, let's not forget, he won the King of the Mountains in the Tour of Spain when he finished sixth. Well, they've tried to attack one another all the way up the last five kilometers of this climb since they wiped out Pantani. Neither has succeeded, so it's going to go to the sprint. Indurain searching for time, and I suspect Leblanc searching for the stage win. Interesting situation, this, because when uh, Indurain last came up mounting with a partner, it was Greg LeMond up to Luz Ardiden, also in the Pyrenees. On that occasion, LeMond wanted time, and it was, in fact, Indurain who got the stage win. I wonder if it'll be the reverse here now with these two. The bomb went on to win the Tour that year. And that was before Miguel Indurain took over. But now they're going to go down to the sprint and Leblanc looks as though he's still got the power in those legs. He's gone. Indurain has made so much of an effort up this climb to get time over the rest of the race that surely he hasn't got the strength left now. And Luc Leblanc knows it. Win number two out of two days for the French and in the mist, just through the mist. I'm sorry we can't show you better than this, but Luc Leblanc finishes just a few seconds ahead of Miguel Indurain. Just a couple of them, I think. And now we wait to see Pantani. There he is. He's come through some 18 seconds down. So Pantani is back. Now the mountains are with us in the Tour de France. And this is the sprint now for fourth place. And no, it's not. That's Rominger come through. And look at the gap. Two minutes, 21 seconds down. As we see the slow motion win here for Luc Leblanc of France. He's going to remember this one. So Luc Leblanc wins by two seconds over Indurain. Tony Rominger finishes only 16th, two minutes, 21 seconds back. He holds second place, but look at the time gap now. De Las Cuevas just about hangs on to third, but those three actually pretty much clear of the rest of the field. So after the rest day in Lourdes, we're now facing the big mountains, the Col de Perisord, taking us now into the Pyrenees for a few traditional climbs for this race. Then it's on after 140 kilometres to the Col d'Aspin. And that's only a short stepping stone then to the giant, the ore category at 2,115 metres, the Col de Tourmalet. That coming at 170 kilometres. And then we have the big climb to the finish after you descend down to Luz saint savoie of Luz Ardiden. At the finish line, 210 kilometres covered. Well, this is the scene that will await the riders when they finally get up here to the ski slope and the perfect conditions for the arrival of the race. And the race last here in 1990 when Miguel Indurain won the stage and second place Le Monde won the tour. A non-starter today, Claudio Chiapucci. But what about the rest in the race, Paul? You know, Phil, there's definitely no feeling of defeat in the village this morning. In fact, earlier I had a chance to talk to Barney Rice from the Gavis team. And he was telling me that Pietro Ugramov, his teammate, and himself had come to form just at the right time. And they're good men to attack in the mountains. The Festina squad with Luc Leblanc are absolutely euphoric after that win two days ago, and they'll be having a go too. Tony Rominger seems a little bit happier after his one day's illness, and he says he'll go out there to attack, even if it's just for stage victories. He's going to put Miguel Indurain under pressure, and the riders here in the Tour de France know where Indurain's weakness is. It's on the mountain stages. Well, now we will find out. We're on the lower slopes, heading up towards the big climbs of the day, and a familiar sight here, Miguel Indurain in yellow. 
Well, this is the first attack that we have had of note as we come up now towards the top of the first climb of the day. This is the Col de Pere Sword, and the rider at the top is Pedro Torres. And he went away at the start of the climb. Well, this is Eros Polly here, the tallest man in the race, and I'm a little bit surprised to see him even trying to stay in contention at the head of the field. But Polly has had enough now. He's taken a little look over to the left, and he's seen the slopes, and he's falling away from the action now as the big hitters start to move into the race. Well, this is the chasing group of uh, Tiddy Marie and uh, Richard Verenck. Udo Boltz is the rider second from the front. A little rider up on the left there is Pellet Jolie, and this is the chase group now, and you can see Miguel Indrain keeping them all within reason here. The attacks that came early on now are starting to be nullified as Tiddy Marie is cracking and the field is coming around him. Marie tried to get away on this climb here, but it's failed, and that's Nelson Rodriguez who goes round him. Lord Delino Cubino and Richard Verenck. And Verenck is now the rider who's pushing hard here for a good day out in the mountains. He lost the climb of the Col de Pere de Sword, but he's now doing a lot better on the Col d'Aspam. Over the top in first place. And this is the time gap, back to the yellow jersey group, ticking away just over five minutes. Well, this is turning out to be quite an amazing tour these last few days for the French, because now Verenck is trying to establish a lead in the King of the Mountains. And he's at the back of these three riders here with Camargo and Hervé. And here he goes again, Marco Pantani. He has this tremendous acceleration when he decides to go on the offensive. And just look how he does it. There's the gap from the field. He's now sped off in search of that leading group. Well, what a refreshing sight this man is. And it's only fitting he should be on the Carrera team because out today, as you know, is Claudio Chiapucci. Lost so much time, he had a fever this morning. This is Lord Delino Cubino now coming up to Richard Varenk. They're battling it out here on the Col de Tourmalet. We are approximately halfway up the climb here. And Verenck is trying desperately now to sew this race up because once you're over the top of the Tourmalet, you have the long descent down to Luz saint Saviour, and then you start the climb up to the finish. And this is the plunge off the Col de Tourmalet. Very often the way the riders come up. Eight minutes 34 now, Verenck has built a lead. He's already into the hot seat in the King of the Mountains. How about this for a little descent? Almost 80 kilometers an hour on the way down for Pantani. We're out uh, towards the finishing climb of Luzardi Den. And this is a very, very good sight indeed for the French. Pantani now picking up the remnants of that long breakaway which Varenka's has fled from. That's Nelson Rodriguez, the passing. And also, uh, not too far ahead of them, was Lord Delino Cubino. And this is Benesto trying to bring themselves steadily back into the race on the last climb, and they've left it awfully late. Three kilometres from the top now for Richard Varenka. Here is a rider who once surprised us in the Tour de France by wearing the yellow jersey, but now he's come here as an established pro bike rider and the Festina continue their fine onslaught on this race. Two days ago, the last day in the Pyrenees, it was that man, Luc Leblanc, and now Leblanc struggling a little bit to hang on to Miguel Indurain's group here, but hang on, he will, and they're trying to reduce the gap to Richard Varenk, but I don't think they're going to catch him. Varenk is going to give Festina another stage win, and I bet the organisers are feeling a bit pleased with themselves now, having given the last place to Festina in this race. And it cost Zen and Yaskula's team their place, and Yaskula was third overall in the race one year ago. Well, Varenk is going to be uh, the first Frenchman to win the climb of Luz Ardiden, if he wins it. But I don't think he can get stopped now. He's a long way ahead still on the road here. The riders make their way up the climb, and still the remnants of the break are ahead of that group containing uh, Indurain and Leblanc. We've still got Rodrigo Summer in there, Pulnikov. Just look at this crowd now. This is a very typical crowd here. The majority of them, believe it or not, are French. Those flags are from the Basque region of France. They expected to see a Frenchman win here. Cubino has won up here before, so too has Miguel Indurain. 
But today, it's going to be a Frenchman in the Tour de France. And there's no stopping this man now. He's going to have the greatest moment of his career. And so, Varenk is counting the corners around the bends. He makes his way up towards the summit now. A rider who turned professional back in 1991 and took the lead in the Tour de France in 1992. He finished 19th last year, and now he's putting in a bid to take an early lead in the King of the Mountains, with all of the big mountains apart from these in the Pyrenees still to come. It must be a marvellous feeling for him now. Bernard Vallée, the former Tour de France King of the Mountains, uh, looking out of the open top of the car behind. He's part of the organisation on the Tour now. And he's the man on the right of the two standing out of the car, as now Varenk. I'm not sure whether he's crying here through joy or through pain. But either way, I'm sure it'll be joy in a few minutes' time. He's just got the last few corners to go. And he's really into the heart of the crowd now, the heart and soul of Luz Ardidem. I really think the crowds are getting as big here now as they are on Alpe d'Huez. And he knows now, he can see the finish line. Richard Varenk is going to win this stage and continue the French resurgence. They've now won the last three stages of this race. First, Duron, the champion, then Leblanc at Otakam, and now at Luzardi Dem with the day's rest in between. We've got Richard Varenk. And this will also be rewarded with the polka dot jersey tonight. Peter de Klerk always telling us he couldn't climb the big mountains. He'll slip out of that. And in will go the Frenchman from Festina. But Miguel Indurain will keep his lead. He's monitored the men that matter on the climb here. One or two have nipped ahead of him, but they're not going to damage his lead too much. As round at the bend, he'll see the line, and Richard Varenk surely could never have thought that this long, long attack from the small breakaway that started it all could possibly have survived. He was six on the first climb today, six kilometres after the start, and then he started to win the climbs and take the prizes. This is Pantani. And Pantani again has done his great heroic charge for the line. He's got clear of everybody. And Pantani is establishing himself just like he did in the Giro d'Italia in the mountains. And the great Spanish supporters, they're cheering everybody on the climb. And I haven't seen the Italian flag fly yet, but Pantani cutting his way through now. There's the Spanish one for you, or the Basque version of it anyway. And just look at the people here as he cuts his way through. And the finish line is right above his head there. It just twists and turns up the side of that piece of granite. And now he's come up towards the top. The clock is counting down on the arrival of Varenk, and this is a real heroic victory. It's going to be four and a half minutes for Marco Pantani in second place. The gaps have opened. This is Oscar Pelliccioli who rode so well and won the King of the Mountains in the Tour du Pont this year. He also won the stage there. And he gets third place. And now the battle for fourth. And maybe it's fifth, because I thought Nelson Rodriguez was up there somewhere. But in this group here, we've got Miguel Indurain. Pulnikov has been brought back. He was away, but he's back in the fold now. Indurain has picked him up. But I think Nelson Rodriguez is off our cameras, racing through the crowd ahead, because you see the cars moving up above the head of Indurain. That'll be the arrival of Rodriguez of Colombia. But this will be the race now we're seeing here for fifth place. And look at the time gaps. So this is going to bring Varenk right up the overall classification. There is Rodriguez. He comes in. He'll be fourth. And this is going to be a battle of the fifth place sprint now. Polnikov is on the left. Indurain is going to lead it out. Leblanc again finishing alongside Indurain, as he did just two days ago at Otakam. But now you know Leblanc, Varenk are all going to be right up there because Romingen again has lost time. Polnikov gets the sprint. Indurain and Luc Leblanc. Well, there's the happy man today. The eyes are smiling of Richard Varenk, the stage winner. And this is how he saluted the crowd. The polka dot jersey, his as well at the moment, at least as king of the mountains today. And a very good mountain climber he proved to be. Tremendous victory by four and a half minutes plus over Marco Pantani. So the French beginning to get the flavor of their own national tour at last.
And now come the tears of joy, because you can bet your life there'll be a few glasses of champagne drunk tonight by Festina, ahead of Pantani, Pelliccioli, Rodriguez, and Rominga losing ten minutes today, and another three to Injurani. Hang on to second place, but he's almost eight minutes back now. Varenki's up to third. Leblanc is there in fifth place. And so the race has had its battle of the Pyrenees, and today there aren't too many of them left, but we stay in them briefly. And happy birthday to Miguel Indurain, who's 30 today. And now let's go to Paul Sherwin with the last man in the race, Marco Vimei. Is it harder than you thought it was going to be? Yeah, because I was, I was going pretty good before. The week before the start, I got third at Nationals, and I thought, well, I'm in shape. But it's, it's nothing compared to the Tour. It's a tough race, huh? It's very, very tough. The comp competition is uh, is the best in the world, so I guess now I'm I'm maybe part of that. Uh, it's the hardest race I've ever ridden, and uh, uh, in a week to go, I hope to make it to Paris. But there's still a lot of uh, obstacles in the way. What about the crowds? Do they help you because the crowds here are phenomenal? Oh yes, uh, it's phenomenal, especially in England. In England it was <laughs> amazing because there were so many people all, all along the course and uh, right here like in the Alps you know I, uh, so, so, so many I saw so many people just here in the Alps and in England <laughs> it was very special yeah it's important so this morning the 13th stage and some of the riders there who aren't hitting the headlines talking to Paul Sherwin and now the race is winding its way away from the Pyrenees and heading out to Albi where the temperature again can be expected to gain in height and over the first little climb of the day, it's called to Mauvaisin, coming after around about 12 kilometres today. And Richard Varenk just reminding us all that he is now the leader of the King of the Mountains. Indurain just alongside Peter de Klerk there. This breakaway establishing itself on the open road. And a chance may be for one of them to stay away to the end, but you know, uh, this race has been one for chasing down breakaways this year. Edwin van Hooydonk, who's tried a lot to slip in. He's about four man off our camera. And still looking for the chances is Bjorn Rees, the Danish rider who rode so well last year. And riding alongside him here is Carlo Bowman, former champion of Belgium. Now, this is Tony Rominger. He's been yo-yoing off the back of the bunch all day. The cameras have stayed with him because everybody has expected Rominger to throw in the towel. I'm wondering if that's what he's talking about. That's, uh, I think it's Jorgi Muller, his teammate and friend, who's riding alongside him because they train together in Colorado Springs in the United States at altitude before they come to the Tour de France. They've done that for the last couple of years. But, you know, I think Rominger has decided to call it quits here. If he does, he's going to retire from this race in second place overall, albeit seven minutes and 56 seconds behind Indurain, and it's going to happen. Rominger is going to pull over to the right of the road and retire from the tour. Well, this is something of a tragedy here because Rominger came as the joint favourite, as the only real hope to take on and beat Miguel Indurain. And one has to ask the question whether indeed it's the pressure and all of the publicity that may well have brought about the final cracking of this great Swiss rider. But he's allowing the race to go away and that's the team car, which is more or less uh, bade him au revoir because he will retire in the second team car, which will follow up from the rear. And I think that's possibly what he's looking for right now. Well, this is sad. Rominger holding back half of the race here. Well, the car has stopped and there it is and it's all over. There's Graham Watson, the British photographer. There's pictures all over my bedroom wall, taking a photograph for the annals. We'll no doubt see that one day, the retirement of Tony Rominger. Well, the race may not hear the news of that until they reach the finishing line, but Bjarni Rees has slipped away, 53 seconds ahead of the field. They've been closing in pretty rapidly over these last few kilometres into Aldi. And Rees uh, is now trying to swing this to the way of the Danes, because, in fact, Bo Hamburger got a surprise win for them down at Trelisac. And now they're trying to close it down. This is the tallest man in the race, Eros Poli, the Italian rider. But they may well have a gain that left this too late, although no, they're closing in. 40 seconds the gap now. Bjorn Rees, who wore the leadership jersey of the King of the Mountains briefly last year. He also got a stage win then, and he also finished very well up overall. 
but he hasn't been seen too much of this year, and Danish television have been giving this race a lot of show, live coverage every day, and now they're going to enjoy this picture, because Bjorn Rees is going to win the stage. And this is a reversal, he's finally come out of his shell, this Tour de France, and Bjorn Rees is going to win it. There's nobody going to stop him now. And it's a tough little finish, you can see the rise there, they come up just before the line, but Rees has done well to hang on. He tries to look through the cars, but don't worry about it because the gap is there. It's not going to be a lot. It may be about 15 seconds. It may be slightly less because they were closing in so rapidly. They swept up everybody in that breakaway. But he's won the stage, Bjorn Rees, and there they are right behind him. And it's the battle of the sprinters of the game with Abdu Japarov taking on Jan Zarada and Martinello. And this time, Zarada takes it. Now let's go to Paul Sherwin with Yogi Mula. Exactly what was the problem that Tony had over the last couple of days? He, uh, in the end now, he had a, a, a bad stomach. He couldn't uh, digest anymore. And um, probably just because he, uh, he had this bad day and uh, he, he had to go so hard for himself as well. And he had to go to the age where he just uh, hurt his body a little bit too much probably. You were the last man with him. What did he say to you before he abandoned? <laughs> OK, he said, don't stay with me too long because you don't get in the race anymore. And that's indeed uh, a very sad epitaph there on Tony Rominger by his best friend Jorgi Muller, while it's the Danish rider Bjorn Rees takes the flowers of the day, finishing nine seconds ahead of all of the sprinters. And the yellow jersey still staying very firmly on the shoulders of this man. He's now destroyed the second place rider overall. And this, by the way, is his wife, who doesn't like to speak to the television cameras. But her husband lets his legs do the talking, and Indurain leading by 7 minutes 56 seconds ahead of Dallas Cuevas. So the race continues along the flat roads without Tony Rominger, and a breakaway of five, having gone clear on the Col de Francois, containing Rolf Sorensen, and among others here, Massimo Girotto. Now, my colleague Gary Imlach from Britain's Channel 4 Television has an interesting tale about one of the tour's real characters. You know, we've always had characters on the tour. A couple of years ago, it was the Panasonics, the Dutch couple who made endless cups of tea on the bleakest stretch of every stage. Then there was the man, of course, who drove the motorised profiterole for a living. But this year, there's only one character on the tour, and here he is, the devil, or since he's German, der Teufel, Teufel. Hello. Guten Tag. Hello. Now, since my German's as good as his English, uh, I can't really get to the depths of what he's uh, all about, but I can say that he is the strangest character we have ever met in our coverage of the Tour de France. What's Max do here? Ja, ich, ich bin hier begeistert von den Leistungen der Fahrer und versuche hier anzufeiern und richtig noch einen draufzulegen, um noch die richtigen Endspurt zu verleihen hier. Well, the gist of all that is that the devil, or Didi Senft, as he's known back home in Berlin, is a bit of an enthusiast. Let's face it, hardly needs translating. Anyone prepared to put on red tights and horns and wave a trident at passing traffic for three weeks is clearly a complete enthusiast. And once you've got accustomed to the sight of a 42-year-old German with a six-foot tail made out of an old inner tube, there's the question of the bike, a monstrous construction with 30 footballs on each wheel. After Inderain, he's possibly the most photographed figure on the tour too. Despite his popularity, though, it has to be said that on the evidence of this performance, the devil does not have all the best tunes. There's no doubting his commitment, though, from Dover to Paris. He's at every stage, sleeping at night in his car and living off supplies from passing tour vehicles. The devil sees each stage through to the bitter end, and after charitably passing up the opportunity to take the hindmost, hitches up his huge bike, packs away his tail, and heads off happy at another diabolical day's work on the roadside. <laughs> well, Gary, it takes all sorts, doesn't it? But now back to this breakaway of five, and it looks like Neil Stevens, the Anse team, is having a go, and I think that's Rolf Sorensen who's gone after him. They're trying to break up this race now as they head down towards Montpellier. Still a little way to go to the finish. Sorensen trying to get on the back wheel here of a very, very quick Neil Stevens riding his third Tour de France. None of these riders are anywhere near Miguel Indurain overall. In fact, Stevens is almost an hour behind in 85th place. 
And Rolf Sorensen is 48 overall, 34 minutes plus behind. But the breakaway has gone. Now, it's an unusual finish here in Montpellier. It's a new finish where they'll race uh, both sides of a main road. They'll see each other on opposite sides. There's what I'm talking about. They actually finish on the other side of the road, coming the other way. And there's still five kilometres to go to the finishing. Yet the actual finishing line is about two kilometres behind the riders in that shot. So they're going to see the location of the chasers as well, which will give them good reason not to panic now. They've got the gap. The main field is still six and a half minutes behind, so they're not going to come back today. And in the hot weather, which has returned, they're not going to waste any energy either, because the race is now heading out towards the hard final week. First of all, in Provence with Mont Ventoux, and then into the Alps. Well, Sorensen has searched for his form since his accident earlier this year, which has left him on the sidelines. He's coming back now after his tour of Italy. This is the rest of the group, Rolf Yerman on the left of our picture there. They've been left behind. It was Pascal Hervé and Massimo Girotto were the other two. And just to give you some idea of the Tour de France speed today, take a look at the rider on the right. But now it's all about who's going to carry away the first prize. As important as ever, some seven and a half thousand dollars to the winner. And Neil Stevens, of course, has never won a stage of the Tour de France and would dearly love to take one now. And unfortunately, the wise old Rolf Sorensen, a classic winner, is now there's the bunch going the other way. They're a long way behind, something like three kilometers, three or four kilometers, in fact. So they're not going to come back. Plenty of time to finesse. Watch out for the other three, though, because they're about a minute behind. But you see, Sorensen will not come round at Neil Stevens, and that's exactly what Stevens doesn't want, because he really could do it bringing Sorensen into the front now. And Sorensen, the finish is as far as the eye can see. And Sorensen is going to make Stevens lead out, and in the end, Stevens is the first to crack physically and psychologically. He's now having to go forward and do what he can. But you know, I'm much sure that the, pair, the power is there in the legs now. He's turned off again. He turned off again. He wants to bring Sorensen through, but Sorensen learned a lot from his father, Jens, who rode in the Olympic Games back in 1960. He turned pro when he was only 20 years of age in 1986, and he's going now. He's slipped it up a gear. He's going to keep Stevens tight. Now Stevens has been forced to take his wheel. Sorensen puts his head down now and goes for it, and I don't think Stevens is going to come back. I don't think he's going to come back. Uh, Sorensen checking his speed all the time. He gets the win, and a very good win indeed for Rolf Sorensen. This is Rolf German, former champion of Switzerland and winner of the Amstel Gold Race when he pipped Gianni Bunyu in a very tight finish. He's going to go now. Massimo Girotto coming. But watch on the right. This is Pascal Hervé. The legs haven't got it this time, and Rolf German is going to take the sprint away from Massimo Girotto. That's the order, but the man of the day, without doubt, was Sorensen. Were you worried all the way to the line because you looked a little bit twitchy with Neil Seamus? Were you thinking about the stage in the Tour of Italy? Yeah, I was. Uh, so long time since I've been winning. I uh, won the first race this year, like William, since I've had a lot of infortunes. And uh, I was very... I was very afraid that, that he would beat me too. I know I'm a lot faster, but then a, a sprint with two is, is always difficult. So I've learned from my mistake with Girotto and I, I pulled the sprint. Rolf, is, uh, I brought, you probably know, he's a, lot, a, a bike rider with a lot more class than me, a lot more talent in the sprint. He, did me, he was doing some pretty slow uh, turns near the finish and I just said, oh, listen, get to the finish and we'll work it out there, you know, but he didn't see it that way anyway. We had to get rid of a go today, we'll, we'll try it again another day. <laughs> Typical Aussie comment that. This is the sprint now for the main field. Just on six minutes down, it looks as though the Lotto boys are trying to work something out here. But again, Abdu Japarov coming through off the rails there. Now he goes across the road, but at least he's well clear of the field. Zarada takes him on to Martinello. These are the three sprinters. This time Abdu gets it. But the broken wrist of Sorensen now behind him as he goes back on the winner's podium as the winner of the stage in Montpellier in the same time as Stevens. Abdu Japarov bringing the field home in sixth place. Overall, Indurain keeps all of his advantage over Richard Verenk, nearly eight minutes. Delas Cuevas third, Leblanc fourth. And this is Mario Scherer, one of 18 riders to give up today, and that doesn't include Lance Armstrong. Just my fatigue, and I need to start preparing for the World Championships. And 
I, I can't start that if I'm too tired. And so Armstrong deciding not to start the next stage, which was stage 15, taking the riders from Montpellier to Carpentras. So they really did crack in the hot weather of the south, but the two Aussies are enjoying themselves. <laughs> what a great couple of riders, and they're pretty strong boys too. So the riders now off into Provence today, and I'll tell you, it's always hot down there without the climbing of Mont Ventoux. And as the riders come through the finishing town of Carpentras with a big circuit still to come, it's been almost a race-long breakaway here by the tallest man in the race, and he's now on the foothills of Mont Blanc, Eros Poli. Well, Poli has been an Olympic team time trial champion, but he's never had a great performance out of his career as a professional. And this is the scene on the climb of Mont Ventoux, the tribute to Tom Simpson, who died here in 1967 on July the 13th on the 13th stage. The great cyclist from Britain and Britain's only world road race champion. This memorial was put up and paid for by the cycling fans of Britain in 1968. And whenever the race passes by, the riders always pay their few moments of tribute to the organisation going ahead. This is what happened in that fateful moment in 1967. Tom Simpson was in pursuit of the Spanish rider Julio Jimenez and he collapsed on the roadside and he muttered what have now become immortal words uh, to Harry Hall, the then race mechanic, which was put me back on my bike. But it wasn't to be and Simpson collapsed and finally was declared dead on arrival when the helicopter took him off the mountain. Well, without doubt, Britain has searched long and hard to find a replacement for this great man, and they may feel they've found him now in Chris Boardman, who took the lead this year for three days. But no one in Britain who knows the sport will ever forget this great cyclist, least of all Albert Bouvet, nor Eddie Merckx, nor indeed on the right, Helen Simpson. And Joanne Simpson, who never knew her father, was only five at the time, on her left. She didn't realise just how good her father was at being a racing cyclist. Eros Poli just passing that very mark now to the right as he goes up towards the summit of Mont Ventoux. He had a lead of almost 30 minutes at the bottom of this climb. He had estimated perhaps he would lose a minute a kilometre. And he, you know, he survived the sort of ride that Simpson would have been proud of. The tall man, Eros Poli, he now is at the top here. And I bet he can't believe this to be still ahead of the field in the Tour de France on the mountain stage. He'd be the first rider to tell you he can't climb a hill. And it's been such a long breakaway for him today. And Marco Pantani again, and you can see the scars on the right side of his leg there. He's fallen off on the lower slopes today. Difficult few moments for Pantani and Injurain climbing, but this hasn't been a hard climb for the main field. They've just kept the tempo going, and gradually Injurain has pulled ahead just the strong men of this tour. And Pantani is turning out to be really one of those strong men now, just like he came with a late rush in the Giro d'Italia, he's doing the same here. Over the top of the Mont Ventoux. And now the long descent for Pantani, uh, for Poly rather, Pantani went over the top there, four minutes and 31 seconds back. This is now Richard Varenk, who's taking on the points for the King of the Mountains. They're going over the top in almost six minutes. There it is, almost six minutes behind the leader, Poli, who won't worry them at all. He's never going to make up the time that he's behind, which is a couple of hours. But he's not thinking of that. He, this is the good news. He's still been told he's got a great lead, and he's now on the way back to Carpentras. There's no way he would have thought he would have survived this vicious circuit when he passed through the finishing line a while ago now. And again, we're seeing Pantani in that unique descending style. And just look at this. <laughs> that, in fact, was Luc Leblanc trying to keep in touch with the other leaders on the descent without too much difficulty, I think. And just uh, look at this right-hand bend here now, because the back wheel of Injurain, he lost it there. Injurain is going around this corner out of control, and he's just locked up the back wheel to get round. It's a nasty squeeze. Well, that's the closest injury must have come to falling off, and it just highlights that you're never sure of winning a Tour de France till you get to Paris. They've got themselves all together and now Pantani's back in this group. No, it was De Las Cuevas, in fact. That wasn't Pantani, it was De Las Cuevas setting the pace there. One kilometre to go for Eros Poli. And I think it's either sweat or tears in his eyes now. 
because this is going to be a big emotional moment for a big man. He's got, he can afford to smile, he's still got the gap over the field and he's round about three, three and a half minutes. Tremendous ride, one of the great escapes this has been and it's not been a slow ride either for, for Poli, he's ridden so well. The only other race he's ever won to my knowledge is a stage in the Mazda Tour in Australia. And now we've got an attack going away from the bottom here, it looks like Ellie has gone clear from that chase group. But here at the finishing line, Eros Poli is going to get only his second win as a professional and it's going to go down without doubt as his best because he's done it so well. Of that six and a half hours in front, I think he's been in the lead for most of it. He broke away around about 60 kilometers into the day and he's going to enjoy this now. I mean, he's been known to go past girls and they're enjoying a coffee at the cafes outside and stop and say hello, but now he waited for no one. What a character. Now this is the chase group coming in. I think Ellie has already gone clear. But this is, no, this is Ellie here. Now he's at the back with Pascal Lino in the centre, Roberto Conti. And now they're going again and Ellie's coming once more on the right-hand side of the road. Conti's trying to get onto him and sat up, I think. No, Conti sat up and looked over. Pascal Lino is the man just behind uh, Ellie. Now, these are the riders who have made this Tour de France for the overall classification so far. And Richard Varenk is having a great tour. He's had another good day in the mountain and he's having another good finish here with fifth place. Now, just take a look at this face here of Eros Poli as he heads towards the finish. The happiest man on today's stage of the Tour de France. And why shouldn't he be? Well, they say a picture says a thousand words, and that said just about that. Eros Poli, the winner, ahead of Ellie by three minutes and 39 seconds. Uh, Virenk, the best of the rest. Stage 16, Valriaz to Alp Duez. 135 riders left in the race of the 189 who started. I wonder how many by the end of the day, as we now are in the Alps, starting with the Col de Menet after 122 kilometres, up to 1,400 metres high. Then a little bit of respite as you go down into the valleys before you start the climbing again. And this time you've got the second category, Col d'Ornon, at 195 kilometres. And then you dive off the top of that one down into the valley below. And then you start the big one, the climb to 1,860 metres of Alp d'Huez and the finishing line. Well, before the stage began, we spoke with Miguel Induane and asked him what he feared about this final week of racing. And I wasn't too surprised with his answers either. La montaña, ¿no? La montaña Alpe d'Huez, Val, Val Torrens, eh, Cluj, son etapas, tres etapas de Alpes muy duras. Si hace el calor que está haciendo ahora, va a ser etapas muy duras, muy difíciles. Eh, a ver qué ver las fuerzas como, como están. Eso es lo, lo peor de esta última semana. And that made me wonder if indeed he tried to win this race in the Pyrenees so that he wouldn't have to work quite so hard in the week he feared most, which was this week through the Alps. It was said they put this week in to try and break Miguel Indurain. Well, I wonder. 227 and a half kilometers, the distance of the stage, and the attack starting right out at the beginning. Thierry Marie leading this attack here. Roman Pensek going through, and that was the result of an intermediate sprint at Borg Guazon. We are now faced with the climb of Alp Duez, the race more or less keeping all together as far as Indurain has been concerned throughout the day, but it won't be now. 8 minutes 44 is the gap back to the group, and that group contains Miguel in Jurain. And so, the Greyhounds have a chance at running at this mountain. It takes around about 40 to 45 minutes to climb it. The peloton containing in Jurain is now at 9 minutes and 10 seconds. And we've got Roberto Conte in this group. Number 134 is Udo Boltz on the telecom team, and that rider has really impressed me this year. He's a very strong rider, but he's climbed so well. One of the few Germans who really can climb. Little Hernan Buena Hora, number 172 for the Kelme team. They've had a great tour. But again, riders prepared to go out on the attack, and Injure, notedly, has been prepared to let them go because he wants the pressure taken off him. He's just marking the men he feels now can affect his destiny in this year's Tour de France, and that is De Las Cuevas, Varenque, and Luc Leblanc. 
But look at this now as the attacks on the lower slopes, and that looks like Conti has gone. Roberto Conti has gone clear. But he's gone very, very early on the climb. We know that the main field is trying to close in, but Conti has gone from this leading group. It's also contained originally Eric Decker, but he's dropped back now, and Alberto Eli and Camargo. But this is now back in the valley of Bourg d'Oison, and this is Stephen Hodge bringing the race as fast as he can to the foot of Bourg d'Oison too. He's working hard now for his two principal actors, and that's Luc Leblanc and Richard Berenc. High up the slopes, and if you look to his left, he might even see that race, I doubt it really, coming down the valley into Bourg d'Oison. But you soon gain height on Alpe d'Huez. And by the way, if any of you are ever thinking of coming over here and riding your bikes in Alpe d'Huez, the, the local office of tourism now presents you with a certificate. Once you arrive at the finishing line, just go down to the office and ask for your certificate, and a very nice one it is too having achieved the climb of Alpe d'Huez, but I bet you, you don't climb it as fast as these riders. And this is Gerard Rouet, solid man on the Bernesto team, doing a lot of early pace making there for Miguel Indurain. 10 kilometers to go for Conti. Rouet doing a great job here as long as he can. Pantani itching to go again. Look at him on the right. This rider has brought so much to the tour and he took one look over his shoulder and he's gone. What an acceleration this rider has. It's not since the days of Julio Jimenez, of Federico Baramontes, Lucia Van Impe, we've seen a pure climber come into the Tour de France. They have that suppleness. They can just accelerate so quickly from the field and then settle down to a much quicker rhythm. And Pantani, now look at that for a gap. Pantani has opened it up, but this, this plucky little rider, Richard Berenc, is afraid of no one this year. He's come again, he's really proud to wear the polka dot jersey as king of the mountains, and he's going to come after Pantani, but whether he's got the legs, I don't know. Pantani's starting to pick off the breakaways now. This is Ronan Pensek. He was in the original move. And back up to Conti. Conti setting the pace on the climb. As he's done from the bottom, he moved very swiftly away from that breakaway. You know, he's never won a race as a professional, and yet he's always had such some great performances. There's the remnants of the big field now, and they thinned out a little bit too. The one name that we are missing is Armand de las Cuevas. Haven't caught sight of him yet. He's, a, for me, the suspect one as far as the mountains go. There's Pantani trying to get himself into a rhythm again now and sweating profusely. He's got an awful lot of men still to pick off in front of him from that breakaway. He gave them, after all, the best part of nine minute start at the bottom of Alpe d'Huez, but there's another one going by. He was in the breakaway, and that's goodbye to Thierry Gouvenou of the GAN team. And since Chris Borman gave them their moments of glory in that opening week, they haven't really distinguished themselves, the GAN team. Still the peloton, what's left of it, together. Four kilometres to the top for Roberto Conti. Heading up a little bit into the mist now. Strength, it says, on the right of the road. Well, I think Richard Berenc has plenty of that. Pantani continues to pick off one by one the riders in the breakaway, and this is Tiddy Mary. Well, he certainly isn't a climber, but again, a good fighter. He was in that break for the best part of the day. He was third over the first mountain this morning. Well, it wasn't really a mountain, it was a small hill uh, after only four kilometers, uh, fourth category rather, after only 14 kilometers. But he's paid the price now, and he'll hang on to finish. He should have a good finish up here today now, near the summit. The race continues to come up from behind. This is a little strong man, I think it's Uriarte for Bernesto, setting the pace. And just look at that, Pantani just goes by him, and that was a moment of respect there from Ronan Pensek, who just sat up and shrugged his shoulders, waved his hands, and thought, how can he ride past me as smooth as that? In fact, he gritted his teeth there, and he may well have caught him back up. Now, Indurain has found his rhythm. He's not so much worried about catching those in front of him as to try and stop those behind him attacking. He will be a little bit concerned about the progress of Richard Varenc at this moment. Luc Leblanc, he's got him under control. But Varenc, remember, is in second place overall at the moment, seven minutes and 56 seconds behind, but he won't want to see him pick up any time on him today. So Indurain's starting to try and chase him down. And the rest are having a little trouble hanging on. Pulnikov here, and it looks as though Alex Zula can't find any more speed in those legs. Zula hanging on, but it's all going to be a marvellous occasion on Alpe d'Huez for Roberto Conti. 
The other Italian to win here was Gianni Bugno, he's done it twice. And there is the World Cup football salute from the Brazilians, but this time it is Italian. And the only other Italian apart from Bugno is the great Fausto Coppi back in the mid 1950s, early 1950s, 1952. This is the first ever victory for Conti, and it's going to be one to savour. Tremendous finish for him. He's led all the way up Alf Duez from the minute the breakaway. He got on to the bottom rung of the climb. He went clear. And now he's got the win and he can sit back and watch the rest contest the Tour de France. Pantani still riding about eighth on the course. There are still another six men who haven't crossed the line in front of him. He's clear of the chase. Look at the cheers now for Injure and the faces on these people. They've waited days to see Injure and climb this mountain. Now they're cheering him up through a corridor of noise. Leblanc is hanging on. So too is Pulnikov, but it's the colour yellow they're looking for. We're now easing up into the chalets here, which gives you the point you're about two kilometres from the summit. As we go back now to Buena Hora who's had a marvellous climb and he's going to take second place across the line. And it looks as though he's glad it's over, and I bet he is. So Herman Buenahora is over in second place. And a couple of kilometres back in the shops there, we've got Pantani. Pulnikov, and they're all, they're all mixed up now. Well, this is a shame. We thought we'd managed to get rid of all the crowd slowing the cars down, but injury is going too quick. And in fact, Indrain picking up some riders just in front of those cars. This is the sprint for third place, and Udo Bolz is going to get it. And that's a super ride by the German. He'd be absolutely pleased to bits with that. Bolz ahead of Ellie on the line, third and fourth. And Pantani now lining up for the finish. Here he comes. So, and there's Varenk going round the corner, not too far behind either. And in fact, they're all over the line now. One by one, just take a good look at these faces. This is Delos Cuevas, and there is the result. Indrain, 7 minutes 21 seconds now overall. He lost a little bit, but only a few seconds to Varenk and LeBlanc in third place. Well, that was the Battle of Alp Duez, and it turned out to be, for many, a little bit of a damp squid because Injurain wasn't brought out onto the attack. What will happen today? Now he's going to face the climb of the Col du Glandon, which comes after 36 kilometres, and we stay in the Alps for another cruel day. The Col de la Madeleine takes us up to nearly 2,000 metres after 79 kilometres covered. That's around 50 miles. And the mountains continue to come at us thick and fast on the road to Val Torrens. And this climb really is one of the most difficult of them all. The climb to the finishing line at Val Torrens, and it is going to be a tough, tough day. And certainly this is one of the days the riders have feared ever since the tour route was announced. 128 of them left now. They're falling out in big lumps every day. But how does Miguel Injurain rule the roost when he's in yellow? Let's join Paul Sherwin, who can tell us. Miguel Indurain is the undisputed leader of the pack and his own team. In this instance, he sprints forward to order Erwin Nybor to stop setting the pace. When the race goes into the mountains, the orders will change. Indurain will use his teammates at the front to dictate the pace that he wants, to either chase down breakaways or even to nullify attacks. He will ride in a slipstream to save as much energy as possible, because once the race reaches the high mountains, the responsibility of leadership lies solely on his shoulders. With three big mountains today, he'll have to use all his strength and tactical know-how to get him through the stage. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, it makes it sound easy, but it isn't. And this is the situation today, 147 kilometres on the road to Val Torrent. It's not terribly far in distance, but it is very, very hard in terrain. And right out at 22 kilometres, a crash to Marco Pantani. And Pantani, in fact, looks a little bit hurt here, as well as being rather annoyed. It was an innocent enough crash. It came as a tumble into the rocks there, but it looks to me as though Pantani a bit stunned. And in fact, uh, Pantani in serious trouble here. You can see his left knee is bleeding. He's got a couple of his Carrera teammates waiting for him. And now Dr. Gerard Porte is trying to give him some painkiller. But the race goes on over the top of the climb. And the Col de Glandon, Richard Varenk again snatching the points as the king of the mountains leader. 
So that's a fine piece of riding. Miguel Indurain goes over the top and zips up for the long descent, but only a few seconds down. Well, there's a superb picture from the helicopter. Now we go down to the motorbike and you get a superb impression of the speed as the riders now descend off the Glendon. Well, Pantani is still trying to get back on terms with this race. There was a moment I felt that he was thinking of actually giving up there and packing it all in. But he's now decided to get on with it and get back up to the main field. Well, fortunately for him, they're not exactly pushing it on the way down here today, otherwise they wouldn't be in such a compact peloton like that. And there he is, back in the race now, as we now head on to the second climb of the day, the Col de la Madeleine, which will take us up to the 79-kilometre point. And again, the Carreras are trying to work over Miguel Indurain and put Pantani into a commanding position. One or two riders coming through very, very well now. Vladimir Pulnikov also riding well. Risha Vereng seems to want to chase just about everything. This rider is showing no signs of getting tired at all. And so some good riding by Risha Vereng. And this field is split towards the summit again of the Col de la Madeleine. And Indurain taking along with him. Alex Zula trying to get across to the leaders. Luc Leblanc also trying to match the pace being set there by Indurain. And number 15 there is Fernando Escata. He's a good climber and he's coming stronger as the days go on here in the Alps. And here now is Peter Ugrimov with Bjorn Rees. They look alike, don't they? The twins from the Gavis team. Except that one comes from Latvia and the other one comes from Denmark. They make their way up the climb. And there's still a lot of gaps here between all of these riders on the climb of the Madeleine, but Ugrimov, Rees and Rodriguez, they're the ones heading the charge up. And Ugrimov continues to lead his teammate Bjorn Rees. And little Nelson Rodriguez doesn't look as though he's going to offer any challenge at all as they approach the banner on the Col de la Madeleine. Another mountain behind them, but still the big climb to come of Val Torrens. Up come the arm warmers now for the way down and zip up that jersey. Over the top in that order, then Ugrimov, Bjorn Riese, Gavis get the first and the second place, but Varenk here fighting out for fourth position. Indurain chasing him, won't give him an inch either. But Richard Varenk going for the points, and can you believe that? But Indurain takes the points off him and stares him straight in the face. Well, that was a little slap over the wrist, I think, for Richard Varenk, because Indurain doesn't have a real interest in the King of the Mountains. But now the descent off the Col de la Madeleine. And still out in front, Bjorn Rees, Rodriguez and Ugrimov. Ugrimov, the man from Riga, who had a great tour of Italy last year, wasn't so distinguished this year. He also managed a good seventh place in the uh, Tour of Lombardy, I seem to remember, last year. Now, there's a nice little view above them. The riders continue to descend. This is the main peloton. Beautiful green countryside here of the Alps, but the riders don't seem to notice it, but it really is a lovely area of France. And the riders staying down here. Still two more stages to come here, culminating with the mountain time trial to Averroes Vorias uh, at Morzine, and then they'll head up towards Paris. This has been a very interesting race, and Indurain having in just two days of real effort, and there's an attack going here. But this is Pantani again, I think. It is indeed Pantani. Can you believe this? This man was on the floor. I know by the way he looked, he was thinking of retiring from the race. He's now got himself together and has launched yet another attack. He's beginning to take over the role of Claudio Chiapucci, this man. He annoys everybody with the way he attacks. And his accelerations are fabulous. So, Pantani going clear now. And we're approaching five kilometers to the summit now and the finishing line. And in fact, it's four kilometers for the leaders here. And Ugrimov and Nelson Rodriguez are together. Bjorn Rees has been dropped. Well, this isn't Rees, but it looks to me as though it is in fact Rolf Sorensen who attacked from the Indurain group a little lower down. He's cracked. And Pantani is going to go by him, but Sorensen's going to try and link up with him. And he's going to have to find something special. The stage winner down in Montpellier. Five kilometres to go to the summit for these two, but the other two are making good progress as well. We haven't seen Bjorn Richet uh, go past our cameras. 
Sorensen is really extended now to hold on to Pantani, and in fact that elastic is stretching and it's going to snap very, very shortly. Here's Miguel Injuen, he's to the five kilometer to go. Banner there, and still setting the pace as well. And Pantani looking over his shoulder, wondering whether to keep going. He's only a few seconds ahead, but a few seconds is all he needs at the moment. He can build on that. Now, there's a bit of a false flat here at Val Torrens because we go on after Le Menwier, where the race has finished in the past. We then go on to this, the extra bit of the mountain, if you like, which takes us on to the finish at Val Torrens. 35 seconds, the gap between Pantani and Le Mayo Jean. And there he is, Alex Zula on his wheel. Very disappointing tour for Alex, really. He hasn't distinguished himself at all. These are the two leaders. Peter Ugamov and Nelson Rodriguez of Colombia. Little Colombian climber. Tried hard to get his stage win in the Giro d'Italia, but he didn't quite make it there. Two kilometers to go for them now. And approaching the finish, and Rodriguez hasn't done too much to contribute to this breakaway. He sat largely behind Ugramov, who now would like him to come to the front, but I think it's probably the wrong time to pose that question, quite frankly. But I don't think he's going to help him now. There's the principal chase group. Indurain Zula, that's the order behind. And now Ugamov. Challenge Indurain in the Gilles d'Italia last year, but not this year. And now trying to get himself a good place overall, because he could well climb up the overall classification tonight, Ugamov, if he can just get a good gap over that field now. Ugramov starting the day in ninth place, 14 minutes and 8 seconds behind, but he's building a couple of minutes, so he's recovering a couple of minutes here. And he'll be the first man to take time back off Indurain for a couple of days. The last man was Richard Berenk, who took a handful of seconds at Alp Duez. So really, Ugramov wants to keep going. I know he wants the stage rim, but he could lift himself up to a podium place in Paris if he keeps the pressure on. Seconds count off very quickly if you start playing cat and mouse. This is through the tunnel at 400 metres to go. Rodriguez, who hasn't been through for most of the climb, isn't going to come by now. And so Ugamov is being left, and he's making it pretty obvious, sitting down, changing gear, and then starting to go. You can tell he's not a sprinter, that's for sure. So Ugamov now going, and little Rodriguez digging deep here is going to take him on. Suddenly he's found his strength. And Rodriguez, Ugamov going to the line, neck and neck. And, and that's, uh, there we are, Ugramov has sat up and said, you've got it, and he's really annoyed with himself about that. And little Nelson Rodriguez, we had the biggest man in the race down in Carpentras, Poli. Now we've got the smallest man here at Val Torrens. And Pantani has climbed so well through the field, he's obviously passed Bjorn Rees, he's now up to third place. And Marco Pantani, again, can't quite make the move to get the stage win, but he's getting away and he's gaining time again in this race. This will give him a nice move up the overall classification. And he certainly deserves that. As he comes over the line, a minute and seven seconds down. Now Miguel Indurain and co, that's fighting out fourth place. Richard Varong still smarting from the mountain sprint, perhaps. So he beats Indurain to the line here. And Zula gets his best place of the race as well. So the stage went to Rodriguez by three seconds over Ugramov, Pantani at a minute eight, and Veronk and the rest of the boys at two minutes 37. But the overall lead still very firmly on the shoulders of Miguel Indurain, although now he's finding himself one or two new names to challenge him. Apart from Varenk, who retains his second place overall, and Abdu Japarov, who is heading for his third win in this points competition. He's riding a solid race, even in the mountains. There's the overall, Indurain leading Vereng, Pantani now up to third, Luc Leblanc is fourth. And this, the beautiful town of Clues, the riders facing four more Alpine passes today. And Paul Sherwin can now explain to us why the riders snatched those newspapers at the top of the climbs. The reason why riders snatch newspapers at the top of the climb is to use as a windbreak on the downhill. As they ride up the mountain slopes, they sweat profusely, and their jerseys are wet from having had water poured over them. The temperature at the top of the mountains is often well below 10 degrees Celsius, so with speeds of up to 60 miles an hour on the descent, the chill factor lowers this even more. To decrease the chance of catching a chill or a chest infection, they'll grab one of the oldest insulators in the world, paper. 
at the end of a tough tour with resistance to illness at its lowest, they have to use every precaution they can to look after their health. Well, that's certainly true, and Paul Schoen should know. He's ridden the Tour de France seven times, and he finished it on five occasions. This the rollout again, and these are the mountains they face. Starting with the Col de Saisy, coming after 57 kilometres, the summit to date. A very difficult climb indeed. And this is almost a tour of the Olympic sites of the Winter Olympic Games here in 1992, based in Albeville. Then it's on to the Col de la Croix Free. After 129 kilometres, almost 1,500 metres, then we continue on to one of the old tour favourites, the Col de la Colombière, which takes us up to 1,600 metres after 155 kilometres. And then it's more or less all downhill to the finish, so no mountaintop finish at the end, and I've no doubt that some of the riders will have noted that. Another fine day in the Alps, light winds and temperatures running up to about 77 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, there are still 128 riders, 126 riders rather, left in the event for the 170 kilometres to Clouse. It really is a lovely part of France, this. And the riders again out on the attack very, very early indeed. Small attack getting away as we approach uh, the bottom of the Col des Saisies. And very, very pretty sunshine. In fact, we've got Peter Ugramov here having another go. Well, you'd have thought he'd learned his lesson yesterday of that long attack, but now he's gone again. And indeed, he's starting to go right through now because this is the Chazelle rider, Arturus Casputis, who he's caught and gone past on the Col de la Coiffe. And that's an interesting move there, Luc uh, Pascal Lino, that was. As they now come over the top, and there's big time gaps here. Lino's gone over 50 seconds down. Eric Broiking here, a minute and 54 seconds down. And Richard Varenk bringing the rest of the main field, including Indurain, over the top at 2 minutes and 37 seconds. So that little breakaway led by Ugrimov, Kasputis, they're the ones that have gone clear. And the Chazal team from France, which is the smallest of the French teams in the Tour de France, they really won the performance today. They've got steadily better over this last 10 days, especially with... Uh, their rider, their leader, in fact, Eric Karitu. But look at the face now of Pyotr Ugramov, the Latvian. He's found his form these last two days. He's relished the arrival here in the Alps, that long attack yesterday with Rodriguez and robbed on the line by the small sprinter. But he's on his own now, so the sprint shouldn't be a problem, but he's got to stay away to the end. And Pantani playing a much bigger role now, not just in the attacking towards the finish, but also in the pacemaking. Look at this. Takes a look over his shoulder now as he revs this up and drags away a handful of riders, followed by Indurain. Indurain paying him a lot of respect this last couple of days. Pantani now becoming a danger to him. Pantani up to third overall, 8 minutes 11 seconds. It sounds a lot, but if you blow up in the mountains, it will disappear in a flash. And this is Luc Leblanc. In fact, he's coming back to the Indurain group. He had a little bit of a problem. I think it was a puncture, but he's had a change and he's coming back quite smoothly. And this is Leblanc's teammate, Pascal Lino, picking up now Casputis on the climb. So just ahead of him, I don't know by how far, but a little way ahead of him is Peter Ugamov. So Casputis, who started all of the action today, is now finding the pace a little bit too tough. And Lino, who could have been thought to have been the best performer of Festina, overshadowed now by Varenk and indeed by Luc Leblanc. This is Ugamov on the climb. Heading up towards the summit now of the Col de la Colombière. The last climb of the day, and Ugramov still in touch with the finishing line here, and the possibility of converting a second place yesterday into a win today. And there's still the time trial to come tomorrow, and I wonder what Injurain will think about that. Absolutely. Tremendous strength coming out of those legs, and he's not looking like slowing down. The clock's on the screen, which means we're almost at the top of the climb here. Ready to count through the second-place man. For a moment, he's lost in the crowd, but he's on his way to the summit, and there he is. So Ugamov, who's taken a little while to find his legs in this year's tour, is now enjoying the last few days. And I think he'll be rather relieved when this top comes. He's kept the pressure on so much, it now seems an awful long way to that line, but keep going. He's in and out of the saddle, and he's almost there. Then he's got the pleasure of the long descent off La Colombia. Over the top, Peter Ugramov. And 
a well-earned drink, this, because he led over the top of the Col de la Croix Fouy as well. That was where he started his move when he picked up Casputis. This is now going to be the battle, I think, for second place at the top of the mountain because the rest of the break has been swept up, including Pascal Lino. And Indurain is in this group, so too Pantani. Luc Leblanc leading the chase up towards the summit. Leblanc looks at Pantani, Indurain is there. Richard Varenk is also still nicely there in his King of the Mountains jersey. He'll try for the points by the summit, and in fact, they're tailing off Pascal Lino. But only just before the summit, he should get back on the descent and be safe with them for the finish. This is the sprint for the finish. Indurain looking very, very strong again now. He's got another name to worry about in the shape of Puy to Ugrimov. He's got to keep the gains down a little bit. Ugrimov may have been uh, a little way down this morning, but he's pulled back three minutes, 30 seconds now. And Indurain goes over ahead of Varenk and Pantani, Leblanc, Conti, Escata and Lino in that order over the top as I saw it. Now a little bit of a hairy descent here because of the no fence as there never is in the Alps as you go downhill. And so the overall situation, Peter Ugrimov today started in sixth place overall after his climb up the mountain yesterday. He's looking for 11 minutes though, and he's now looking for around about eight to take the lead away from Indurain. But of course, don't forget the time trial still to come tomorrow. And it's a mountain time trial. The race wanted it back in. They thought it might be a leveler for Indurain, and they've got it. Now the descent starts. We'll try and organize the chase back here. But you can see the difference in ability as they start to go down. Riders, some riders will take the risk and go down quickly. And somebody attacked from this group as well, because Pantani's been left dangling off the back. And he's not the best of descenders by the look of it either. He's trying to accelerate in the straight and get back on terms, but somebody's going quickly, and it looks as though, indeed, it was Richard Varenk who attacked, and Indurain has got across to him. Now, that is how much esteem they're holding Ugramov in, because they're trying to bring him back. They're worried about the progress of Ugramov, and Indurain is chasing him. There's the remnants of that lead group that went over the top of the Colombia, round about three and a half minutes down. This is Pantani. Now looks as though he wants uh, to see if anybody else is going to come up and give him a hand here to finally pick up those two at the front. A problem here for Luc Leblanc. This was the problem he had on the climb of Colombia. He solved that problem, but he still... He may well have changed his bike on the climb, and now he's trying to get his saddle right. Nobody waited when he did stop. He was with the group, and he just came to a screeching halt on the right of the road, but he wasn't off the back too long. Inside the last 10 kilometers now. Ugrimov seems set, and what a wonderful result this will be for him to take the stage. Second yesterday, what are, well, where you find the strength to have two days like that and what has been two terribly, terribly hard days, I don't know. But Ugrimov has gone, and these two aren't doing a great deal about it. They're closing in, but they're inching in is a better word, because Varenk willing to work now, but we're now down into clues. And the streets are nicely closed off. It looks like it's a good finish. This is a very wide road indeed. And a magnificent crowd turning out too to see the race here. And the race will start here tomorrow for the time trial. And there are the mountains in the distance are where we're headed, right up to Morzine and onwards to Avoriaz. At this time of the year, of course, many of the crowd are holiday makers. And once they saw the route of the Tour de France, they made sure they booked the holidays to coincide. And so Peter Ugrimov comes home. Second yesterday, a win today. What will the last few days of this year's Tour de France hold for him? He's going to climb right up the overall classification, and you know a podium finish in Paris after two days is now a real possibility. So Ugrimov is in, and it's going to be a sprint for second place between Varenk, who never seems to give up at all this year, and Miguel Indurain, who has controlled everything. The race in the Alps is going very much his way. This is the chase behind Ascarta. And Pantani at the back, and Roberto Conti is in there as well. And look at this, now Varenk inviting Indurain to come through. Well, here he comes, Richard, what are you going to do about it? Because Indurain just starts on with the power, and he rides Varenk off his wheel and tries he might. He's not going to get on to Indurain. Miguel Indurain will take second place. He will concede two and a half minutes to Peter Ugramov. And Richard Varenk also concedes time to Ugrimov. It's going to be tighter at the top now. 
Injurain is in in second place and will be happy with that. And there's Ugramov in the background as he's being interviewed. Now he's on the podium saluting the crowd. And the result makes good reading if you come from Latvia. Ugramov ahead of Injurain, Varenk, Eskata getting fourth place. And overall, Richard Varenk drops a second to Miguel Injurain. He's now 7 minutes 22 seconds. Ugramov is up to third, pushing Pantani to fourth, Leblanc down to fifth. And so the time trial today, two climbs on the way, a one at Leger and then into Avoriaz and up to the top for the finish at 1,850 metres. And this is the mountain time trial. Now the start of the big men, and this is Luc Leblanc. The riders going at the back end of the field at three-minute intervals, and Leblanc leaving with four riders to follow him, Pantani, Ugramov, Varenk and Injurain. The route is really a very difficult one after a flat start. Miguel Injurain, the last rider to start. Familiar start position for him as he starts in yellow. And a lovely buffer of 7 minutes and 22 seconds over Richard Varenk. I would think the Varenks really will try just to keep away from the might of Miguel Injurain on the climbs today. He's also trying to produce a good ride to get a podium finish in Paris. More or less the last chance of that today. And this is the man who threatens everybody, Peter Ugrimov, first and second in his last two starts. And now heading up towards the best time ahead of Pantani, who's just gone through with the best time at 41.13. And that is at 24 kilometres here at Leger. And Ugrimov goes through 39.54. Still counting, though, that wasn't quite the checkpoint, so he's just going to be over the 40 minutes, but he's still going to be better than Pantani. As the time will stop just around the corner here, and Peter Ugramov now heading on to the next slope, which is the climb to Avorias. Here is Richard Varonk, and just look at this now. His time is a long way behind. The best time so far of Ugramov, who's gone through in just over 40 minutes, and he's conceded over two minutes at this stage indeed to Ugramov. So you know, it looks as though Varenk is slipping away here. The man who started the day second overall is crashing out of the top three. This is not looking good for Varenk, and this is Pantani up towards the summit now of the climb itself at Avoriaz. The weather has taken a turn for the worse. This is Ugramov. Ugramov and Pantani were starting three minutes apart. And Injurain behind all of them, and he makes it look as though he's on a Sunday club run. He is not contesting, he's not going to win this stage. In fact, we're going to see a surprise here because Ugramov is going to throw really another spanner in the works because he's going to produce another great ride up this mountain. And this is the arrival of Luc Leblanc and a good ride by Luc Leblanc. The best time so far, Charlie Motte riding his last tour was the leader. But Luc Leblanc has got the lead now and here comes Pantani. This will improve it even more. And Pantani's going to come home with a time of 1.24.37. He now takes the lead over Leblanc. So we've got Pantani, Leblanc. And just to finish now, the top three riders on the stage over on the overall GC. This is the third man, Ugramov. And look at the time. Ugramov is going to win again. Ugramov, 1.22.59. Now, Varenk is in a hopeless situation. And according to the time checks, Injurain is losing time as well. So Injurain was right to ride hard in the early part of the tour because he hasn't ridden as well as he might here in the mountains. It's been a plucky ride again by Richard Veronk. He hasn't been caught by Miguel Injurain, but look at this. Almost seven minutes, six minutes, four seconds behind Ugramov. He's lost his second place overall. And no sooner has he finished than Miguel Injurain arrives, but he is going to be slower than the best time. He's going to be slower. He's going to finish third, in fact. Third place for Miguel Injurain, and that was a surprise, but Injurain, I feel, didn't put his heart and soul into that. He had too much of a time game. Pantani second to Ugramov, Injurain third, and Luc Leblanc in fourth place overall. And Richard Varonk down from second to fifth overall after that ride. He's now ten minutes behind, and a podium finish in Paris looking bleak. So to the 20th stage and goodbye today to the Alps and what a week it's been. We're now leaving Morzine and heading to the Lac Saint-Point. And this is another new finish for the riders, four kilometres to go. And this is Eddie Seigneur trying to salvage something for Gann here, but the whole field aren't very far behind him. It's been a day of attack and counter-attack. And the riders now going right around the lake here and heading back towards the finish. 
It's a big loop and the crowd enjoying the spectacle for the first time, the arrival of the Tour de France. What they should see will be a battle of the sprinters because they've all come back together again at three kilometres to go to the finish. And it looks as though Jesper Skibby is having a real dig here now. But they're going to come after him. The teams are trying to hunt this one down for the sprinters as they try now to close it right up. And in fact, the TVM rider just sits up and awaits for the arrival of the rest. And he's going to ask him if they're going to have a little go. But this looks like, in fact, it's Vyacheslav Yekimov who's having a go now. He's tried it once before on this race and it hasn't come to anything. He tried to win a Futura scope and he was caught about 250 metres from the line, but he's having a go again. Well, he once was the world record holder over 4,000 metres and that's about the distance he's trying to pull it off at. But you know, they're not. Well, they're always wise to this move. He's won one stage like this, Vyacheslav Yekimov, and it wasn't this one, I don't think, because they're going to wipe him out now. In fact, he had a great Tour du Pont. He won that this year. He looked to have some marvellous form, but it hasn't really come through, and he really is enjoying his finest season this year as a pro. But there we are. It's all wiped out, and the GB team's trying to warm things up, perhaps for Johan Museo now. We haven't seen too much of him recently. And also the Motorola team. They've had a very quiet tour this year ever since Sean Yates led the race briefly for one day by that single second. This is Steve Swart trying to pull them clear. But again, the riders right on to him. And the team under the one kilometer to go banners, but there's still the riders are trying to get away before the sprinters come into play, but there's no chance of that now because as they come up towards the line, the sprinters here have got the front. This Mario Chiesa leading it up towards the line now. No sign yet of the green jersey of Jamaluddin Abdu Japarov, but the others are here and trying to mix it with the best now. As they move across the road, Chiesa's wiped out of this one and the sprint opens up and it's a long run for the line. The rider from Castellón is Francois Simon on the right, but now it's Jan Zarada who's got the front, and there comes Abdu Jabarov from nowhere. Abdu Jabarov on the line, and it's the same three over the line again. Abdu Jabarov coming from absolutely nowhere. Look at the speed here of the rider in green. And Silvio Martinello is the rider second place, but just look at the speed of Abdu Jabarov as Jan Zarada makes his run that fraction too soon. You've got to be inch perfect to win a sprint. And Abdu Japarov is just about that right now. And there it is, the overall classification at the end with one day to go. Indurain leading Ugrimov, Pantani, Leblanc and Varenk and no change overall on that flat stage. Well, you can never say that this is a Mickey Mouse race, but you can say this is Mickey Mouse. Oh dear, it's Minnie. And that's where the start is and the finish awaits them on the Champs-Élysées in the heart of Paris. The Arc de Triomphe at the top and the Spanish band are here too to welcome, well in this case, among others, Bjorn Ries of Denmark or even Pascal Lino. Olaf Ludwig denied his stage win so far and the flag of Spain of course for the man they all want to see win his fourth consecutive tour. So, Miguel Indurain, as they call him, now waiting for his fourth consecutive Tour de France. The last day should be a formality as long as he keeps out of trouble. And the roll away from Disneyland, the three champions of the Tour. On the left for the third time in green, Abdul Japarov for the first time, the King of the Mountains, Richard Varenk. And for the fourth time, Miguel Indurain. The beautiful sight of the Seine and the Eiffel Tower, and that's what the riders want to see. Paul Schoen once said to me, you feel all the pimples come up on your arm when you ride round France and then you see the Eiffel Tower. Well, this has been a great stage on the Champs-Élysées. It's been full of attacks and it's very rarely an attack succeeds, but this one is now going to stay away. Frankie Andreo of Motorola leading the attack here on the front. And this is an interesting breakaway to Eddie Seigneur. Is the rider now at the bell? Andreo drops to the back. We've also got Bo Hamburger in this breakaway. Jörg Muller and Arturus Casputis. That's the breakaway. It went away on the road on the circuits here of the Champs Elysees. And the main field, as you can see now, are out of it at 47 seconds. Who wants the Bonestos will not be interested in this breakaway. Their tour is done. They'll just wait for the handout of the check now. As Miguel Indurain will shortly receive the first prize in excess of $300,000. But he won't win the last stage, that's for sure now, as we go through the Tuileries and head along towards the Place de la Concorde. 
The last few metres of this year's Tour de France, it really has been a great race. It's had a big dropout too. Only 117 riders are going to finish of the 189 who started in Lille, which by car from here is about an hour and a half's drive. They've been right around France this year, and an attack has gone on Frankie Andreu, the man who's launched it. Well, Frankie Andreu's had a second place previously in the Tour de France, but never a win. He's enjoying, too, his best season on the Motorola squad. Now, can Frankie Andreu cause the surprise and the victory? Well, it'd be a very popular victory in his team if he did. He's going to now go across the Place de la Concorde. Eddie Seigneur is flying after him. That is Eddie Seigneur, and let's remember too that Chris Borman of Gann won the opening stage. Can the Gann team close it down? Because Frankie Andreu is fading. It's an awfully long finishing straight here to the line. And Eddie Seigneur has got it, and poor old Frankie Andreu is going to have to be content with second. Eddie Seigneur rounds it off for France with another stage when they've had a great tour of the French this year. And is he happy? Eddie Seigneur gets the victory. Frankie Andreu is in second place. And Bo Hamburger, the winner at Tresiliac, gets third across the line. Muller is fourth. And Abdu Japarov has even dropped the field to get sixth place. He didn't even need to use his sprint. So he crosses the line there. The scene, that terrible crash he had a couple of years ago. And he wins the green jersey. And that is now the cram on the Champs Elysees here as they try to locate the man in the yellow jersey. But let's look at the stage result first. Eddie Seigneur winning ahead of Frankie Andreo Hamburger, Muller Casputis. So a win for Miguel Indurain by 5 minutes and 39 seconds in the end over Pietro Ugramov of the Gaywis team. Third, Marco Pantani. Two newcomers there and great to see them. Luc Leblanc finishing fourth, best of the French with Varenk in fifth. And Roberto Conti, the winner at Alpe d'Huez, finishing in sixth place. But now the prize for the fourth year in succession to the great Spanish rider Miguel Indurain. Under pressure from every direction this year, he has again come out on top. And this man too, he smiles regularly now, he never used to smile, but now he can. He's won the green jersey for three times, can aim at Sean Kelly's record now of four. And a first time victory for Richard Varenk. He rode a brilliant race, always in the action and never a lucky winner of anything and also a team victory too for Festina. So the Tour de France has been a remarkable event and I'm sure there'll be more stories to tell next year. We shall remember the favorable win of Miguel Indurain until we meet again, Phil Liggett with Paul Sherwin saying goodbye.